So welcome to the Money Markets and Mindset podcast. I'm your host, stock market coach and option trader, Jason Brown. And so I want to talk about the thought process of investing in the stock market and removing the fear because a lot of people get scared of investing in the stock market or putting money to work. And they really get scared when the market's up real big, then it's down real big. And that's normally when you really see the fear come out. Everyone's willing to invest, or at least everyone's fear is a little bit lower when everything is just going up. When everything's going up, your friends uh, are just calling you, telling you, just buy something, just get in, you can't go wrong. And most people don't even think twice. They just like, boom, I'm buying some Dogecoin, I'm buying some Amazon, some Apple. They just buy something when everything is going up. So I find it interesting that when everything is going up, most people don't have fear. But when things are going down, people start to have fear about getting into the stock market, which is actually kind of weird because when things are going up, that means you're constantly paying higher and higher prices and hoping that it continues to go higher versus when it's going lower, knowing that you're getting in at a discount or maybe you're not getting in at the all time high. And that now you have an opportunity that when things turn around, that you can start to make some money. I'm not sure why people don't think about it like that. But here are the four things that I think people fear. And if there's a fifth or sixth thing or something I didn't cover, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. So I think the number one thing that people fear when investing in the stock market or if they've invested before is losing money. Losing money is like the number one fear. It's like I'm scared I am going to lose some money. And when you think about being scared that you're going to lose some money, when we think about going to a casino, if you gamble, if you go to the casino and you go and you say, I'm going to pay $100 on the slot machine, $200 on the crap tables, how come we're not afraid? How come we don't go in the casino and be like, ooh, I'm afraid I'm going to lose some money? In fact, you go to the casino expecting not to make money. You go, you go expecting to lose money and you kind of pawn it off on, but at least I had a good time. We're going to have some fun, but you go into the casino expecting to lose money. How can we never be like, let's go to the casino. Like, Oh, I don't know. I'm scared. I'm scared. What if I lose money? We don't, we don't do that, but we do that in the stock market. When people go and play the lottery, people will go buy a lottery ticket. No problem. But they don't really buy a lottery ticket and say, I'm scared. I'm scared. Like you never hear people say that. Most people say, I'm excited. Ooh, if this number hit, I'm a millionaire. I won the Powerball or whatever the case may be. And so I was kind of looking at those industries and saying, stock market invest, people are scared. Go to the casino, people are ready to have fun. Buy a lottery ticket, people are excited. So a casino is fun and you're willing to lose money. A lottery ticket is exciting and you're willing to lose money. So how do we take that and bring that into the stock market and remove the fear so that you can get involved and not be scared? And so when you think about losing money, you only lose money if you buy, let's just say you're buying a stock. You only lose money if the stock goes down. I think the, the the mindset has to be when you look at a casino and you look at a lottery ticket and you're willing to buy a ticket and knowing that you may lose money. I think a part of why you're willing to lose money is because you you set aside a certain amount that you're willing to go to the casino and have fun with. You set aside a certain amount for that lottery ticket that said, this is my opportunity. It's worth a dollar ticket, five dollar ticket for the opportunity to make win that Powerball or whatever that might be that could be life changing. And so I think when you look at the stock market, you have to look at it the same way and ask, what type of money can you set aside that you would be okay if the stock market didn't go up or if a specific stock didn't go up? What type of money can you set aside that you're like, I'm fine if this doesn't go higher? And then number two, What type of money can you set aside and say, it's just, or how can you change your mindset to say, it's fun to be an owner of some of the companies that I do business with. It's fun to be a shareholder of Nike when I'm wearing the shoes, but now I own a piece of the company. It's fun to be a part of owner of Apple 
when I use the Apple iPhone and I own some of the stock. And so we have to figure out how to make it fun owning stocks to kind of bring it in alignment with that whole casino energy. It's just fun to be in there in the atmosphere and have, um, you know, and gamble. But we want to also make it fun to be part of the stock market club, to talk to people, to be in our community forums and be like, I own some Apple. I own some Amazon. I tell you, I know I personally feel good when I'm like, yeah, I own 200 shares of Tesla. I own 500 shares of Amazon, whatever the case may be. Like, it actually is fun to say that versus like, yeah, I went to MGM last night and lost a thousand. <laughs> so it's 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 finding that balance of how do you make this fun? And then when you look at the lottery ticket aspect, you're putting that money at risk for a greater payout. And so when you look at the stock market, you have to start tying it to your greater payout. So um, can this create generational wealth for me? How much invested over X amount of period of time could this change my family tree? And when you start to look at the big picture like that, it's a small price to pay to own some stock or some shares, knowing that it could potentially change your family's tree um, down the road. You can go back and look at companies like Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Apple, Google back in their day when they were just, you know, came out as IPOs. And you see these articles all the time where they say stuff like $10,000 invested in Google back in, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you would be worth 4.3 million or something like that. And so you, I'm sharing that with you to say that the stock market and the right stocks have the same ability to change your life 10, 20 years down the road, the same way that buying that lottery ticket, if you keep spending a dollar, five dollars a week and you add that up over four, five, 10, 15 years, if you've never hit in the lottery, you might be, I'm not saying you spent 10,000 on the lottery, but my point is you spent some money that on something that may not ever materialize where you also could have been in the vehicle that if you put money in it long term, the overall market always goes higher. If you look at 9-11 when a plane crashed into uh, the buildings in New York, if you look at the you know banking collapse, the real estate market crash, you look at the pandemic with COVID-19, you take any moment in history that was you know dire or bad for the economy, we eventually came back out of it roaring higher and for longer. And so in longer term, we came higher. So when you think about that, it should remove the pressure of being afraid of losing money. And then there's, there's, you know, so then the, the, so if we look at the second thing that people are afraid of is picking the wrong stock, which really piggybacks off number one, which is losing money. But number two, people are afraid of picking the wrong stock because what happens if you pick the wrong stock and it's not going up? Well, you go right back to number one and you're losing money. And so how do you alleviate the fear of picking the wrong stock, which eventually leads back to the number one fear, which is losing money. Well, there's a couple of things that you can think about here. Number one, you can get the education and learn how to read stock charts, learn how to do fundamental research. Now, most people don't want to learn how to read stock charts, don't want to learn how to do fundamental research. They just like, tell me what to buy, I'll buy it. That's also part of the problem because you don't know why you're buying it and when to get out. But let's just forsake Let's just say for sakes, the easy way to pick stocks without going through fundamental analysis, technical analysis. Number one, just think about good companies that you do business with. So, for example, Apple, we have an iPhone, great company. You might have a Mac. They make great products. They have a good music system, a good ecosystem. That is one company that you could feel good about buying and holding on to. Take Tesla, for example. Tesla is leading the charge with electric vehicles. Um, They haven't even reached their max capacity. They haven't released the 18-wheeler Tesla truck, the Roadster. They have so many other areas of electricity with with respect to cars they can go into. Probably going to be around for a while. Let's take a look at Walmart. Most of us probably shop at Walmart or Sam's Club. Most people don't know Sam's Club is owned by Walmart, right, Sam? Um, There's Target who sells, you know, similar stuff to Walmart, deodorant, groceries, underwear. These are things that people are going to continue to need. And so when you look at picking a group of good companies, per se, when you think about 
when you think about how you would lose your money, I don't think most people really put this in the in the like their thought process. The only way that you can lose all of your money if you bought Apple, Tesla, Walmart, Target as an example, is those companies would have to go out of business. So Apple would have to go out. Of, I'm talking about for you to lose 100% of your money, account go to zero. Apple would have to go out of business. Tesla, which means someone built a better phone, a better music system, better distribution system, better retail store, a better, uh, you name it, better app store, everything. Someone just came out of nowhere and built everything better and overtook Apple. Could it happen? Sure. Is it likely to happen? No. Tesla. In order for Tesla, in order for you to lose all of your money with Tesla, Tesla would have to go out of business. We would have to decide that we no longer care about electric cars. We would also have to decide that even though Tesla has some of the arguably best electric cars, furthest range electric cars, best autonomous driving, um, that someone came from behind, beat them at their own game, built a better battery, better car, longer range, was able to market it better and overtook and also at the same time we just didn't want a tesla anymore and they had to go out of business do you see how ridiculous that sounds most likely that is not going to happen walmart someone has to build a better retail chain retail store has better pricing power than them uh, and, and at the same time we all wake up and realize like ah we no longer want to shop at walmart no one needs to go to a local store retail store like that anymore and so most likely won't happen. So when you look at picking good companies and owning the stock, we're not even talking about options because there are different strategies that could help you alleviate the thought of losing money. But I just want to keep it simple. Just own the stock. Just owning the stock. The only way you can lose all of your money, these companies have to go out of business. So you could go to sleep at night knowing that it's a good chance that these four companies I mentioned won't go out of business. Apple, Tesla, Walmart, Target. So that would remove, I'm not saying you can't lose some money. We'll talk about, um, we'll talk about number three, which would be like a, the third fear here. But I just want to talk about number two for a second and say, if these companies aren't going out of business, you can remove the thought from your head that you're going to lose all your money. Now, the second thing that you can do to remove that fear is you could just look at an ETF which is an exchange traded fund. So an exchange traded fund, you can say, instead of going in and picking Apple, Tesla, Walmart, Target individually, maybe I'll just buy the SPY. I'll just buy the SPY, which is mirrors the S&P 500, the sector spider S&P 500, which basically saying I'm buying a collection of all the stocks in the S&P 500. And we know over time, the S&P 500 or the overall market averages about, I believe, 11% annual return over time. And so even if you just bought the SPY and parked your money there, I want you to think about what that's saying. In order for you to lose all of your money, all 500 stocks will now have to go out of business. What are the chances of that happening? So you move from buying individual great companies to buying an entire index or um, ETF, exchange traded fund, which mirrors the S&P 500 index. You bought the whole index or ETF that mirrors the index, that would mean all 500 companies would have to go out of business in order for you to lose all of your money. Now, what are the chances of all 500 businesses in the S&P 500 going out of business? And what are the chances that since the market's inception, it's always gone higher, but the moment that you buy the S&P 500 is the one time that it's never going higher. That would also mean the world is coming to an end and we're about to explode and blow up and aliens are probably about to come down and take over. <laughs> sounds ridiculous, right? I know that's my point because it sounds ridiculous when people are afraid to invest in the US economy, the same economy that you're going to work in, the same economy that's giving you your paycheck, paying for your family, the same economy that you're raising up your kids in, the same economy that since its inception has returned on average about 11% return, no matter what type of tragedy we've gone through as a company, as a country, I should say. All right. So you can pick individual good stocks or you can pick 
ETFs that mirror the overall market. And that should eliminate the fear. Now, let's talk about fear number three. And fear number three, you're like, okay, Jason, I got it. Buy good companies, Apple, Tesla, Walmart, Target, those just to name a few, or buy an ETF that mirrors the overall market like the SPY. Got it. But now fear number three comes in, and that is, what if I need the money before the investment matures? Like, what if I buy these stocks and investments and in two weeks, three weeks, a month, I need the money? Well, here's the thing. We technically shouldn't be investing with money that we're going to need in two weeks, three weeks or a month. So that's number one, the problem, because the market is not going to move on your time frame. The market doesn't say, you know, Jason, you're a good guy. Your rent's due next week. Let's send these stocks up so you can make some money. We'll let you sell. And once you get out, we'll bring them back down. Like the market doesn't do that. The market doesn't care that you have rent due, a car note, groceries, any of that. And so we shouldn't be putting money into the market that we're going to need in a very short amount of time. So it kind of goes back to, you know, thinking about the casino or the lottery. We should only be coming to the market with money that A, we can afford to lose, and then B, money that we don't necessarily need to use right now. And if we don't need to use the money right now, then we can avoid fear number three of needing the money before the investment matures. Remember, on average, the market returns about 11%. Um, in a year. It might mean over two years or three years, the average return might be 11%. So you could have a year where you're down 5% and you're down 6% the next year. And then the third year, you're up 22%. Does that make sense? So on average over those three years, you got an 11% um, return or on the third year, I'm sorry, it might be up like 33% or something like that, where you look back and divide up, say, oh, I made 11% over the last three years. Right. And so as long as you don't need the money, have to take it out before you can allow the market to do what it do and just mature, then you're going to be okay. And so to avoid that fear, don't put money to work that you need for a car note, a house note, or anything like that, that you're going to need in the very near future. And then I think the fourth and last fear that most people have, or they're gun shy about investing is People don't like looking or feeling stupid. And you look and you feel stupid when you lose money. At least that's your perception. But I have a different perception of people who lost money. See, when people get into the stock market and place an investment or place a trade and they lose money, my perception is they don't look stupid. To me, these people look like heroes. And here's why. It's so easy to sit on the sidelines and be like, ha, those people lost money. That's why I don't invest. But man, can you imagine a life where everybody sat on the sideline and never took risk? Can you imagine a life where people didn't take risk to build a better car, to build a better electric battery, where nobody took a risk to build a better vaccine? No one took a risk to build a better cancer drug, a better HIV cure. If no one ever took the risk to do um, knee replacement surgery, hip replacement surgery, could you, could you just imagine a world where we took no risk? We just, this is as good as it's get because we don't, we fear failing. We fear looking stupid to people who probably don't even matter and people who don't even have the confidence and guts to even take calculated risks. And so I think we have to change our perception of looking stupid, right? I don't want to look stupid to my friends. I don't want to look stupid to my wife, my husband, and I'll look stupid if I took this course, tried to invest, and I actually lost money, it's like, and, and those of us who support people who do invest, we need to be more supportive when they do lose money and say, you know what? You might have lost money, but you went for it. You tried it and asked the real question, which is, what did you learn from it? 
What did you learn? How can we come back bigger, better, stronger so you don't lose money on the next investment or the next trade, which is really what we should be doing if we're supporting someone who's investing. But even if you don't have that support, we need to look at ourselves and say, no, I should be proud that I took a calculated risk. It didn't work out, but I got in the game. I didn't sit on the bench. I didn't sit on the sidelines. I didn't sit in the cheerleading section. I was in the game and played. That's how people feel when they lose NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs. It's like, but we made it to the playoffs. We gave it all we got. It didn't work out, but we will always have that experience. And now we know what it takes to win the NBA playoff. We know what it, how much harder we have to work. We know how good it felt even just getting to that level. And that's how you got to look at the stock market. It's not, oh, I feel stupid because I lost money. It's like, man, but I'm in the game. I played the game. I got off the bench. I got off the sidelines. And then feeling stupid is an internal feeling. So looking stupid is all about the external. You worried about people around you and how they view you. But feeling stupid is internal. And feeling stupid is thinking, why did I place that trade? Why did I buy that stock? Why did I buy that company? I feel stupid, okay? And feeling stupid is is, is kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky because this is where you got to do some self work. This is where you got to do some inner work. And when I placed, you know, I, and I had to learn this too. I, I started, I remember when I first started investing, I said, man, like if I lose money, I'm like, it, at least I was in the game. But then when I lost money, I didn't say, well, oh man, you're so stupid. I said, no. How do we get better at this game? How do I learn from this? I look at people like Warren Buffett, Bill Ackerman, all these people who manage huge um, hedge funds, investment funds, and everything like that. And I have to ask myself, do you think that they never lost their first $100? Do you think they never lost their first $1,000? Do you think they never lost their first $10,000? How about $100,000? How about some of them have lost their first million, 100 million, right? And so I said, if I'm going to get to the big boy level where they may have lost a million bucks, do you think on your way to making a million or losing a million, you think you're going to lose 2,000, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000? And so I had to change my mindset. And that's what I want for you. I want you changing your mindset around losing money. I'm not saying I want you to become good at losing. That's not the message I'm trying to send here. What I'm trying to say is losing money, feeling stupid is usually a symptom of losing money or not knowing what you're doing. Both of those you can control. Not knowing what you're doing, you can get the education. You can paper trade, you can practice trade. If you get the education, paper trade, practice trade, and still lose money, that's not the time to feel stupid. That's the time to understand that this is part of the game. It's like driving a car. You can take driver's training, turn your windshield wipers on in the um in the winter and the snow, you could drive slow. You could stop at every intersection and some drunk driver can still hit you. Does that mean you're a bad driver? Does that mean you should stop getting in cars after that? The answer is no, things can happen, but you learn from that. You get back up, you get in the car and you drive and get to your destination. And that's the same thing with the stock market. You don't stay down and say, I feel stupid. You get back up, You get back on the horse or in the car and you drive towards that investment destination of achieving financial freedom and having your money work hard for you. So here's the thing as we wrap up, guys, I want you to take inventory of why you are scared to invest or if you've invested before, why you're gun shy. That's the word that keeps coming up. I'm gun shy, meaning you're scared to pull the trigger and get back into a trade. And I want you to assess where is that fear coming from? Is it the fear of losing money? Is it the fear of losing money? Is it the fear of picking the wrong stock? Is it the fear of needing the money before the investment matures? Is it the fear of feeling or looking stupid? I want you to take inventory and I want you to ask yourself, how can I overcome the fear of losing money? How can I set aside a certain amount that I'm willing to risk? So now I don't fear losing it. I've already earmarked it in case things go wrong. 
Okay, how do I go to step two and say, well, there's no way I lose all of it because I'm buying good companies. And the only way I lose all of it is they'd have to go out of business. Or I'm going to buy an ETF that mirrors the overall market. And unless the overall market collapses, I shouldn't lose all my money. And then number three, as long as I've given myself six months, 12 months, I shouldn't need that money for anything to pay any bills or anything that's going to stress me out. And then work on your mindset about feeling or looking stupid. Again, forget about looking stupid because that's outwardly. That's the forces other people put on us. Who cares what they think? And then feeling stupid, get the education, get the knowledge, and then work on your self-worth. And remember, you're a hero for even have tried because most people are sitting on the sidelines and they never got off the sidelines and got in the game. They never even knew the emotions and the thrill of seeing the stock go up, then go down, then go back up. It's just an energy that they will never feel regardless if the trade worked out or not. You felt that you're alive. You were in the game. You know what it felt like. You can have that conversation with someone like, oh, you was in that trade, too. Me, too. Yeah, I lost a little bit. You too. Oh, man. But I was up this much. Right. It's just like, ah, when you talk to somebody who's either been in the trade that went right or a trade that went wrong, that's just this immediate bond because you like, I feel you. I saw that candlestick. I was there when that news report came out, too. I should have bought more. Like, ah, it's just a different type of connection and different energy. It's the energy that you'll never feel if you're on the sidelines and you're scared. So get in the game and have fun with it. I'll see you on the next episode.